In World War II, the airplane assumed a major role in the strategy designed to effect complete victory in the first truly global war. The final knockout punch in the war against Japan was delivered from the air. For almost four years of war in the far-flung Pacific, this was the objective of every soldier, sailor, marine, and airman serving in the Asiatic Pacific Theater of Operations. The first attack on Japan was launched early in the war. In April 1942, the U.S. carrier Hornet moved deep into enemy waters to a position only 600 miles from the Japanese coast. The Hornet's daring raid caught the enemy off guard. Colonel Jimmy Doolittle had trained his men diligently in the technique of taking off in a bomber on a short runway. But this was the first real test. The attention of every man above decks was focused on that first takeoff. Sixteen B-25s took off successfully from the Hornet's deck and headed for Japan. Their mission, the bombing of Tokyo and three other Japanese cities, had a tonic effect on America's sagging morale. The airmen who had crash-landed successfully in China or off the China coast were decorated by Madame Zhang for their courageous flight. Two years later, the first land base from which raids could be made on the enemy's homeland was put into operation. From China, America's newest heavy bomber, the B-29, could fly to Japan and back in one hop. Other bases, capable of accommodating the superfortresses, were put into operation in India. Thus, the whole of Eastern and Southern Asia, from Tokyo to Rangoon, was within range of the new U.S. air weapon. In mid-1944, the air attacks on the Japanese homeland effect alone. From this point on, the air war was designed to blast Japan into total defeat. From Mariana's bases, B-29s would soon be able to attack Japan in some numbers, and the air war on the enemy's home islands could be greatly accelerated. But the building of those bases was a job of far greater proportions than the customary airstrips hurriedly built on newly won islands. On terrain so rugged that the enemy considered the building of a large air base impossible, U.S. engineers went to work on the construction of three huge airfields which were to have a direct bearing on the time needed for achieving the final victory. By November, the first of the massive runways was almost ready to be put into operation. The engineers worked around the clock, putting the finishing touches on the field. In October 1944, the first B-29s touched down at their new home bases in the Marianas. A 1,000-mile flight from California had taken them just 25 hours. For the all-important missions which lay ahead, the crews had trained in Kansas, Colorado, and in the Caribbean. Several hours and 1,500 miles later, the B-29s were over the enemy's homeland. Over Tokyo, the bombardiers went to work. At 30,000 feet, the superforts were reasonably safe from enemy anti-aircraft fire, 
but not entirely. Over the target area, the planes were attacked by Japanese fighters. were knocked out of the sky by the Superport's crews, but more kept pouring in on the big bomber. Mission accomplished, the B-29s headed quickly for their Marianas bases, 1,500 miles away. During those first flights back from the target, the crews of some of the crippled Superports ended up in the chilly waters of the North Pacific. Starting on November 27th, the enemy struck back with a vengeance, attacking the U.S. base on Saipan. The raiders did a fair amount of damage. Some B-29s were total casualties. Many of the enemy raids on U.S. bases in the Marianas were made at night. Meanwhile, on the decks of U.S. carriers in northern Pacific waters, additional raids on the enemy's homeland were prepared by the Navy. The carrier-based pilots of the Navy's fast striking force were assigned targets in the heart of the enemy's industrial areas. Specific targets on that factory area. Smitty, bring your second group a little farther east and come down, putting your division on these two large assembly plants. And Sam, knock these big buildings out. Now you have specific targets to hit, and I want you to all get hit. A few hundred miles off Japan, the strike was launched. In no time at all, the planes were over the first of their targets and peeling off for the dive. Other planes attacked enemy airfields. to work on enemy harbor installations and shipping. Inevitably, not all the carrier planes escaped unharmed. In many cases, the pilots managed to bail out successfully. In his rubber boat, the downed pilot had a good chance of survival. Rainwater replenished the limited supply of water each flyer carried. Thus, if the weather were reasonably good, the pilot had a better than even chance of being spotted. In World War II in the Pacific, U.S. submarines performed a valuable supplementary function, spotting and picking up airmen and sailors whose vessels had been destroyed by the enemy. Some 500 U.S. servicemen were rescued at sea by U.S. subs in the Pacific during the war against Japan.
With the seizure of Iwo Jima in February and March 1945, U.S. fighter planes had a base from which they could easily fly to Japan and return. At the Marianas B-29 bases, preparations were made for heavier attacks against the enemy's home island, now that the big bombers would have fighter cover over the target area. The operation of the bases from which the raids against Japan were launched became a larger and more complex problem during the early months of 1945. The mapping out of routes to specific targets in Japan for some thousand B-29s was only one of the exacting jobs which added to the traffic problem for the operations center of the 21st Bomber Command. This office was a highly geared nerve center in the preparation of the raids over Japan. Shortly before takeoff time, the crews had their targets spotted for them on the radar scope. How the scope should look when you've located the target and have gain and tilt properly adjusted. Here's your target today. The arsenal is located to the left side of the town. However, since the three degrees beam width tends to spread a town out along an axis perpendicular to the airplane, do not aim at the edge of the town, but a little inside the left edge. You can see then that it's important that you hit your initial point on the money and make an accurate turn to the target heading. Otherwise, you may not be able to find your target. Final preparations for the flight were made in an atmosphere which was always charged with excitement. For the crew members, no mission over the heart of the enemy's homeland ever became routine. The start of another flight on the most dangerous run in the Pacific Theater was always a dramatic moment. 300 super forts were ready for the takeoff. The giant planes hurtled down the runway right on schedule. Some 1,500 miles from this island base lay the heart of Japan, the objective of the 300 B-29s in this early April raid. Over Iwo Jima, halfway to the target, the superforts were joined by Mustangs of the 7th Fighter Command, based on that island, recently seized by U.S. Marines. The P-51s embarked eagerly on their first mission to Japan. With fighter support, the big bombers were much better able to cope with enemy attacks in the skies over Japan. But the Japanese fighters gave battle nevertheless. The Mustangs went right to work. The enemy planes kept boring in on the Mustangs in spite of their losses. 21 Japanese fighters were shot down in this raid. Sometimes a U.S. pilot got a close look at his recent adversary. The B-29s assigned to hit the Tokyo area usually checked their position by sighting in on Mount Fuji before moving in on the target. Over. Go ahead, Bombardier. The site's set up. We're ready to bomb. Roger, out. Pilot, correct eight degrees right. Roger. Bombardier, open bomb bay doors after turn. Roger. Get ready on 70 degrees. Ready on 70 degrees.
ready on 60 degrees. Mark. Bombs away. This was the moment when the long flight paid off. The super forts dropped their bombs right on the target. Beginning in March, B-29s from the Marianas began dropping incendiaries on Japan at night. But these night attacks were discontinued since the results were not particularly impressive from the standpoint of damage done to military targets. The super forts intensified their daylight attacks on industrial and military objectives in Japan during the early spring months of 1945. Tokyo came in for the largest share of attention from the B-29s of the 21st Bomber Command of the 20th Air Force. These mass attacks had a shattering effect on Japan's capital city. The city was bombed into a great mass of rubble. Most of Tokyo's fragile buildings had simply disappeared under the heavy pounding from the skies. A few, like the Diet Building, where the legislature met, had survived. Tokyo's inhabitants were thoroughly broken in spirit. In March, the B-29s had an emergency base on Iwo Jima, located midway between Japan and the Marianas fields. Crippled super forts, unable to make it all the way back to their home bases after being hit over Japan, came into Iwo. Some 2,000 B-29s landed at Iwo. Some not too successfully. Thousands of airmen who would otherwise have perished were saved at Iwo. The U.S. Third Fleet also closed in on Japan to administer a softening up of the home islands in preparation for invasions by U.S. amphibious forces. Admiral Bull Halsey, the Third Fleet's commander, moved boldly into the waters off the Japanese coast. On July 17, 1945, U.S. and British warships fired some 2,000 tons of shells into the coastal area northeast of Tokyo. The fleet units encountered no opposition during this daring attack on the enemy's homeland. Japan was ripe for invasion. In the United States before the war, Albert Einstein did extensive research in the field of nuclear fission. Dr. Einstein's findings were developed still further at the University of Chicago's Metallurgical Laboratory by Dr. Enrico Fermi and his associates, who worked out the process for making plutonium and produced the first atomic pile. In July 1945, near Alamogordo, New Mexico, Dr. Robert Oppenheimer and his fellow scientists, who had worked on the development of the new secret weapon, prepared themselves for the critical first test. The area was heavily guarded. Doctors Vannevar Bush and James Bryant Conant were among the few spectators. Ten seconds to go. Five, four, three, two, one. The first atomic bomb explosion was an impressive success. 
In the Marianas, at 20th Air Force headquarters, General Curtis LeMay and his staff worked at feverish speed on the planning for the use of the new top secret weapon against the enemy. If the atom bomb could be safely transported by air to a point over Japan, its use could well have such a devastating effect that the war might be materially shortened. The target was finally selected. The Japanese city of Hiroshima had escaped damage in U.S. bombing raids on the home islands. On that sunny August morning, Hiroshima had no premonition of its fate. On Tinian Island in the Marianas, a B-29 named the Enola Gay prepared to make the first atomic bomb run. Over Hiroshima and Nagasaki, the course of world history took a new turn. The new weapon blasted the enemy completely out of the war. Japan no longer had the will to fight. Hiroshima lay in ruins. Within a few seconds, the sizable city had been demolished by the atomic blast. In early August, the U.S. brought the enemy finally to the point of surrender after some 44 months of the most grueling warfare. A number of Japan's largest cities lay in ruins. The course of aggression on which the Japanese nation had embarked some 14 years earlier had led to a tragic end. 